This is Margaret Booker. I'm with the Nature Conservancy in North Carolina, and I'm coordinating together with Beth Buchanan the Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network. And what we want to hear today is the burn participation tool that was developed in our grandfather district and um, surrounding lands that we call the Central Department in the Southern Blue Ridge. And you'll hear from Josh Kelly, the staff biologist with Wildfall, and Greg Phillip, the district fire management officer on the grandfather district in the Pisca Forest from North Carolina. So I'll turn it over to Greg first. So this is Greg here. Um, the very first slide um, just talks about the folks who are who, who took part in, in putting this together. David Ray and Margit, who you just heard from, from the Nature Conservancy. John Crockett, he's our district ranger here on the Grandfather District. Gary Kaufman, forest botanist and ecologist, amongst other things. Um, Bart Kickleiter, who is the FMO here, um, he's recently left and went to California for a job. Um, Lee Marston, she's the ORA um, over recreation here on the district. Myself, Chris Williams, our wildlife biologist. We're all with the Forest Service. Then Ryan Jacobs with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission and Josh Kelly that Margie introduced. So a good team together, multidisciplinary, um, did a lot of great work together. We seem to be frozen all of a sudden. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this next slide, you'll see the uh, ecoregions in the southern Appalachian region. We fall in the southern Blue Ridge, and we're kind of in the east, central eastern. Um, you see the boundaries in red. So we're in the middle eastern part in between uh, the Piedmont and the Ridge and Valley areas. Again, we're zooming in a little bit. The... the um, Red boundary there is the Fire Learning Network Central Escarpment, which pretty much borders the Grandfather District. Um, it's north of I-40, south of the Blue Ridge Parkway, and west of Highway 321, heading up towards um, Blowing Rock, North Carolina. And I will pass it on to Josh here to talk about this slide. Um, so the Fire Learning Network in the Southern Blue Ridge has been meeting for a number of years, and one of the first activities the Fire Learning Network did in the Southern Blue Ridge was to identify the vegetation types um, that we thought uh, benefited from fire. And we have a lot of different um, environmental conditions here that lead to a lot of different vegetation types, and we don't think that all of them benefit from fire. Um, and one of the things that makes um, our analysis of um, fire suitability, uh, prescribed fire uh, prioritization possible is ecological zone modeling that was um, paid for by National Forest of North Carolina and uh, TNC and was completed by this guy, Steve Simone, who's an ex-Forest Service ecologist and um, just a really excellent ecologist and um, pr pretty much a, a GIS whiz. And um, so this slide just depicts the variation of vegetation across the Grandfather District and across the Central Escarpment landscape. At the very highest elevations, there's spruce, all the way down to uh, shortleaf uh, pine and oak forest at the lower elevations. Um, this next slide just zooms in on that fine-scale landscape pattern, and you can see a very sharp break in between um, the Piedmont and foothills and the mountains. So the Piedmont and foothills, you see a lot of red of the shortleaf pine and oak forest, and then going up into the mountains, you see a lot of other colors that indicate more um, montane vegetation like uh, pine oak heath or uh, cove forests or northern hardwood forests, et cetera. And uh, because um, I'm not sure if all of you have been to the southern Blue Ridge, I, I thought I'd take you on a little photo tour of some of the different vegetation types. And so on the very tops of the mountains, we have spruce fir forests, uh, generally above 5,000 feet, and they are quite wet, um, can be very beautiful and, and lush and scenic, and we don't generally think of them as benefiting from fire. That fire does play a role. Um, I think the estimated uh, fire return interval in a spruce forest is uh, 400 years or so, but um, we're, we're not trying to burn these places. There's a lot of uh, threatened and endangered species in these island and uh, montane habitats. Uh, also at high elevations and in moist settings are northern hardwoods forests that are also um, 
generally not thought of as, as benefiting from fire, and we're not trying to apply fire in those areas. Um, this slide is of a, a dwarfed northern hardwoods forest called a beach gap forest that's dominated by stunted American beech and uh, other stunted northern hardwood trees. Um, acidic cove forests are uh, cove forests um, that have a lot of rhododendron generally uh, and other acid-loving species. This is a photo of the world's largest living eastern hemlock that uh, is on a preserve owned by the Highlands Area uh, Land Trust near Highlands, North Carolina. Again, these forests don't burn very often. It's very difficult to burn uh, these forests. They're very moist and shaded. Uh, another kind of cove forest is a rich cove forest. These are our most uh, economically valuable and productive forests. They uh, grow the most, um, the biggest trees, the most economically valuable, uh, and also uh, a lot of economically valuable, valuable medicinal herb species. Um, and we start to move into a, a little bit um, drier areas, you get uh, a lot more oaks. And this is a, a picture of a very large northern red oak in a montane oak uh, habitat. And, and we do think that fire plays a role with, with oaks and uh, is one of the major disturbances in oak forest. And these more um, moist oak forests, we think they burn less, obviously, than in some of the drier oak forests like this one. This is a, a typical dry mesic oak forest in the mountains. That's a white oak. Um, and it's actually a pretty old growth forest, but it's also highly degraded. You can see the very dense um, sapling and shrub layer in that slide. And that's a typical condition of uh, dry music oak forests that haven't burned in quite a while. Um, you may also notice uh, white pine being one of the major uh, species that's invading in the understory. This is a dry music oak forest that has burned in the past 10 years. And this is pretty much desired condition for a lot of dry music oak forests. Um, less um, shrubby plant growth and more herbaceous growth. Um, and moving into an even drier forest, this, this would be sort of a dry site oak forest. And this is in Linville Gorge and also has burned. And uh, before the fire, it had a very dense shrub layer and has now uh, started to thin out a little bit. Um, and uh, as you move into lower elevation sites, you get shortleaf pine mixing with oaks. And th this is an example of a pretty nice shortleaf pine oak forest. These are some of our most degraded forest types. Uh, in the southeast and in the uh, southern Blue Ridge. They tend to be on broad, flat ridges that were not uh, difficult to farm or clear. And um, partly because of that and partly because of fire exclusion and suppression, um, they tend to be fairly degraded. Um, this is a pine oak heath forest, and this is typical of many pine oak heath forests in our region. And, and pine oak heath forests are some of the driest, most exposed ridgetop sites in uh, low to middle ele elevations in the southern Blue Ridge. Um, they're dominated by table mountain pine and pitch pine, which are fire-dependent um, tree species and have a number of uh, fire-dependent um, herbaceous and animal species associated with them as well. And uh, in a lot of areas where they haven't burned in decades, like this one, they have a very dense uh, sapling and shrub layer. Um, this is a view overlooking the Pigeon River Gorge and um, outside of the Grandfather District, but it's pretty typical of what, what goes on in the Grandfather District. You can see um, on the left-hand side of the slide, um, pine forest, uh, that's on a, a southwest face. And then on the other slope, you see a more of a, a mixed oak and pine forest. And that, that slope on the, uh, the left-hand side of the slide uh, stand replaced in a wildfire in early 2000. Okay, so our goal in this project was to be burning in the right places. Um, just to make a long story short, in the past, uh, some of our burn planting might have just been, you know, areas that were surrounded by roads or areas that were easier to get to, and, um, you know, we wanted to look at were we burning in the right places. So the left side would be an example of where we want to burn. That's the Linville Gorge. It has burned uh, several times in the past decade, and on the right side of the screen, um, you know, kind of forest that you wouldn't want to burn in. So the first step, um, using the potential natural vegetation, um, identifying the fire-adapted communities. Um, it turns out on the grandfather district, that's about 69% of the district in those oak and pine forests. The oak and the yellow, and then the pines and the red. You can see the breakup on the slide. <coughs> 
So the next step was uh, identifying potential units. Uh, a really useful part of this, this process was bringing in folks from the district who have worked it here a long time. Um, you know, folks not really active in fire anymore, but knew the district better than, than a lot of folks, um, knowing the roads and trails and just the way the land lays. Um, so we just broke out a bunch of quad maps and magic markers and started drawing lines on roads, on rivers, on trails, on stuff that we knew already appeared on GIS layers and uh, stuff that we could use as, as burn boundaries. And so, and, and really tried to take a broad brush approach, we weren't trying to, to nitpick the details on each of these units, whether it was uh, the right management area or if it had a timber sale or if it, we could or couldn't burn it. We were just identifying areas at this point of the process. And we deal with the other parts in mitigation. So here we are sitting at the table um, discussing some of the units. And from our first and second cuts, you know, we've changed quite a few times, um, different sizes, different shapes, and, uh, you know, worked on this process. Um, everybody's been real flexible in, uh, in getting to a common goal. The ecological criteria we considered. Um, you can read this as good as I can, but um, dis distribution on the landscape, spacing them out. Um, current condition of the units. We, got, we have a high uh, fire occurrence here on the district, so, so some areas have seen a lot of fire in the past and, and some others haven't. Burn history and return interval. Presence of fire adapted rare species, which you'll see later. Presence of fire sensitive species. Invasive species threats. Percentage of site that's fire prone acreage of fire adapted vegetation, number of wildlife openings, and presence of fire adapted state natural historic areas. Um, so we considered all of those factors and we decided to throw out about two thirds of them just to keep it simple. Um, we ended up using um, acres of fire adapted vegetation as a surrogate for a lot of the things we were looking at. Um, and um, so again, we just clipped those potential natural uh, vegetation areas to um, the burn units, and we wanted to weight pine acres because there's good evidence that the yellow pine for forests burn and need to burn a lot more frequently than oak forests. So we weighted those by three and scaled them down to the other um, categories by dividing the acreage figure by 100, so that each um, every 100 acres of an oak forest would equal one point on a, a potential burn unit score, and uh, 100 acres of pine forest would be three points. We also um, gave 10 points for globally rare fire dependent species, and we categorized those as uh, G1 or G2 species. Uh, those are G, G1 are species that occur in less than five locations, and I think G2 is less than 20. Um, then state listed fire dependent species. So these are state rare species that aren't either G1 or G2. And we also looked at state natural heritage areas with fire dependent um, uh, vegetation. So these are some of the best examples of natural vegetation in the state that also benefit from fire. So nationally significant sites got 15 points, um, state significant sites got 10 points, and five um, points for regionally significant sites. And we're, we're very fortunate in North Carolina to have an active um, natural heritage program that has uh, been working for, I guess, four decades now, and they have, have a wealth of information that can be used uh, on these sort of projects. And we also looked at uh, wildlife openings. These are managed uh, openings to promote um, game. And there was uh, um, the desire to look at these because we're, a lot of these areas would be appropriate to manage with fire if we were going to manage them as sort of natural habitats. And then at the bottom of the slide, you can see the equation that we used in our first draft. It's you know three pine acres divided by 100 plus oak acres divided by 100 plus all those different uh, globally rare species, state rare species, state natural heritage areas, and then we um, we uh, multiplied the number of wildlife openings by a quarter. That was our draft score. So just to test that concept out, we looked at a number of areas. Um, just as an example, this is the Boone Fork area. Um, the boundaries of the potential burn unit are in black. Um, pine forests are in red, and oak forests are in yellow. And the translucent purple, that's a state natural heritage area, the um, Boone's Fork Johnny Knob area, and it does include uh, good quality pine oak heath vegetation and uh, dry oak forest. Um, it also has rare species uh, in, in that state natural heritage area, but they are not associated with fire dependent vegetation. They do not benefit from fire, so we did not um, give that unit any points for those species. 
So here's a look at how the spreadsheet works out. The total acres of the site, 2,800, 700 acres of pine forest, uh, 1,200 acres of oak forest. Um, we've got our state significant natural heritage area, um, five wildlife openings for a grand score of uh, 45 points. And uh, I'll let Greg talk about the next area. So the next area is what's called stack rock, and uh, traditionally this is one of those areas I was talking about before. We have prescribed burn in the past um, due to the ease of, of it with roads and creeks and water, um, so we decided to score that as well. Um, again, same same legend, uh, the black border is the potential burn unit, um, yellow oak forest and red pine forest. So those total acreage, um, 58 came out in pine acres, 528 in oak acres. And then uh, nothing else as far as the fire-dependent species. Uh, there were four wildlife openings for a uh, one point, and so you could see the total score of eight, and much less than the uh, than the Boone Fork area. And uh, unfortunately, that's where we put some attention in burning, and uh, so this is kind of what we're trying to figure out. And short off, I'll just continue with short off. Short off is in the Linville Gorge Wilderness. It's on the east side of the, in the southeast side of the wilderness area. It has seen fire, let me see, two times in the last 12 years. Uh, again, the uh, burn units, um, we have them broken up in three areas in the Linville Gorge. At this time, we don't have approval to do any prescribed burning in the wilderness area, but um, as you'll see from the scores, um, this has helped our case in, uh, in working towards that. Uh, a lot of pine forest acres and smoke forest acres as well. So very fire prone. Uh, there's a rain shadow that occurs uh, off the Black Mountains just west of there, and uh, so sometimes storms will come through from the west, the rain will be deposited up the Black Mountain, and the lightning and everything else will come down into the Linville Gorge. So testing the concept of the 5,092 acres of the short off unit, um, 2,071 of those are pine acres, 1,266 oak acres. Um, the big point jumps come in with the globally rare fire point dependent species, the Hudsonia Montana, <clears throat> and then the state rare fire dependent species, you see five of those, um, one state natural heritage area. So a grand total of 134.79. Um, we expected that the score would be high and short off due to the uh, due to the pine and due to the, the Hudsonia. So um, it does a pretty good, pretty good uh, job of modeling what we saw. So we did that same process through all of our units, and uh, you can kind of see how the range on this first cut, this first attempt came out. Um, the three top areas um, are all in the Linville Gorge. Um, again, we don't have permission to burn in there yet. Um, working towards that. Um, one other place, Cat Ridge, comes out on number 17. We'll talk about it in a minute. It also has Hudsonia, and uh, so we'll, we, we decided that we the results were good, but we might need to do a little more work. So here's just a, a map of the potential burn units with the scores in them, and you can see how they're spread across the landscape. So Josh will give us a critique of that first run. Um, so we had some critiques of our, our first run. Um, one is that it emphasizes acreage, which uh, was a success. That's, that's what we were going for. We wanted to work towards um, promoting larger burn units. Um, Singe Cat Ridge, which uh, Greg uh, talked about a moment ago, uh, scored 17th, which is a problem because Singe Cat Ridge not only has a really cool name, but it uh, has this very rare plant, Hudsonia Montana, that only grows in two locations. One is at Singe Cat Ridge and the other is in Linville Gorge. And it's very fire dependent. And um, we wanted uh, folks that came after us maybe two or three decades down the road to not forget about that Singe Cat Ridge population of Hudsonia Montana. So we wanted it to uh, come out a little higher. Um, we also um, got some feedback from folks with the Wildlife Resources Commission that uh, Scoring the acreage of wildlife op openings rather than the number would make a lot more sense, and we all agreed about it. So, uh, missed a couple of uh, potential burn units, and there are probably more potential burn units we could continue to look at in the future, but we're getting close to um, most of the reasonable, uh, logistically reasonable burn units and ecologically important burn units also on the, on the district. So what, what we did is we uh, decided to give any site with Hudsonia, Montana, 50 points. That was one major change we made. The other major change was to score the acreage of wildlife openings rather than the number. And uh, that did change things a bit. Um, this is just to go back uh, to that um, 
first table and emphasize if you go down the list, you'll see Singe Cat Ridge at 974 acres scores at 32 points in the original run. It's the highest scoring of any uh, unit under 1,000 acres, but it's still only 17th on our priority list, and we wanted it to be higher, like I explained before. And um, this is a picture of Hudsonia, Montana, that pretty yellow flower in the upper right-hand corner. And then the slide is a, a photo from an airplane of its uh, preferred habitat, these uh, rocky ridge tops uh, on Linville Gorge and Cinchcat Ridge. So when we took a look at these uh, scores the second time, you can see uh, here's the look at Boone Fork again. And um, this time I've emphasized the wildlife openings a little more by uh, having them in that aquamarine color. Um, and uh, scored a little different, uh, n not a whole lot different, didn't really change its ranking too much, but it actually scored a bit higher looking at the acreage of wildlife openings. It added 12 points to the score instead of, I think, uh, one and a half before or something on that order. Um, so now it's up to 57 points. And in the Linville area, um, again, the Linville Gorge units stayed the three highest units, but their scores increased. The two units with uh, Hudsonia, Montana, the Chimneys and Shortoff, went up uh, quite a bit. So now instead of the top score being 135, it was 175. Um, and you can see how that plays out in this table. We've got 2,000 acres of pine, 1,000 acres of oak, et cetera. We've got Hudsonia, Montana at 50 points. Then another globally rare species at 10 points, all the state rare species, and the state natural heritage area for a total of 175 points. And, um, you know, the fact that Linville Gorge has so many uh, of the highest priority areas for fire makes a lot of sense. Um, when you look at all the rare species that are there, for one, and on the other hand, when you look at some of the dendrochronology work that's recently been completed by Charles LaFon and Will Flatley out of Texas A&M, um, they looked at a couple of sites on Linville Mountain just outside of the wilderness uh, and uh, found a dendrochronology record all the way back to 1700 with Table Mountain Pine. And between uh, 1700 and 1930, the mean fire return interval was uh, around seven years. Um, and after 1930, the fires almost completely ceased. So every one of those vertical black lines on the slide is an incidence of fire that was showed up on tree rings. Um, and the result of that has been a couple of uh, wildfires in the Linville Gorge area that have burned extremely hot. And this is the 2007 uh, short off fire that burned during uh, basically a 100-year drought. And you can see how dense the stems were. And, uh, you know, we, generally that Pine Oak Heath forest would have been a lot more open with fire. And uh, because it burned in a 100-year drought uh, and had had fire suppressed conditions, it burned down to sand, essentially. And uh, these are really severe fire effects that we do not want to see reproduced on the landscape. Um, this is what Short Off Mountain looks like in Google Earth. You can see on the lower right-hand corner of the screen that uh, slope with all of the white on it. That's all sand. That's where the picture was, the photo was taken. Um, so that we, we would much rather prescribe burn this site uh, and both benefit the rare species, but also maintain the vegetation types rather than uh, lose the topsoil and, and totally start over. So we'll look at Singe Cat, second run, Singe Cat, excuse me, Singe Cat Ridge second run. Um, <clears throat> Singe Cat Ridge will be the unit to the right side the, with the number 77 in it. Uh, again, we uh, increased the, the, the 50 points for the Hudsonia and no wildlife openings in this area. So that was going to be responsible for the for the big shift. So again, of the total acres under 1,000, um, 227 in pine, 472 in oak. Then you add the Hudsonia, Montana. So that 50 points really pushes it up and, and gets it where we think it ought to be um, with, that, with that rare plant um, on top of everything else, but underneath the gorge. So you can see the new weighting at, at the second cut. Um, we still have the three areas in the Linville Wilderness um, up top, and the, but Singe Cat Ridge moves probably to where it belongs at number four, just underneath those units. And one thing we didn't mention, these 40 some odd units um, total about 95,000 acres on the district. The district is 192,000 acres or so, um, so that's a pretty good chunk of the district. Here's a similar map as the one you saw before with the revised ecological scores. 
in there. And so we can talk a little bit about the results. Um, I, uh, it's 42 potential burn units totaling around a little over 95,000 acres. Uh, the scores range from 7 to 175. Um, the, you know, we found out that the model is acreage driven. We did that on purpose, but it's responsive to rare species and fire adapted natural areas. And uh, again, we've, we've pounded on this point. The Linville Gorge Wilderness has the top three scoring sites. So conclusions, uh, we need to burn Linville Gorge, and we're working on that. Maybe in the next few years we'll, we'll get that opportunity. Um, it's looking like we can restore about 18,000 acres of the highest priority sites with fire in the next 10 years. Um, the district would like to grow to about 7,000 acres a year. Um, right now we did about three this year, and historically we've been around 1,000, so definitely uh, you know, fuel to grow the program. Um, looking at it, it looks like our model does work for the Pisgah National Forest. Um, you know, other land manners might want to look at this idea and, uh, you know, some locally adaptable values uh, for your landscape could work in easily. And that's one thing I really liked about the process we went through is um, that we tailored it to the desires and the conservation goals of, the, um, of our local landscape and, and local land managers. Um, and I, I think it's simple enough, um, uh, or a similar approach is simple enough that it could be adapted to a lot of different areas. Um, and that's our last slide. I think we probably finished early. Yeah. Very good. That leaves plenty of time for discussion. Um, I'm going to try to unmute people um, if there's too much noise like that. Um, I'll have to hit mute again and then just raise your hand to talk. Okay. Questions, anyone? I have a question, but I don't know how to raise my hand. Well, you're open now. <laughs> Go okay, for it. sorry. Um, my question was, um, how many acres a year do you burn on the Grand Plata District? And the second portion of that question is, um, were you looking at that list of priority, you know, priority areas? How far down that list do you all think you'll get, you know, in, in the next, say, 10 years? So if the first question was how many acres have we been burning, is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, this, uh, on the average, we've been around 1,000 acres the last three years. Um, prior to that, maybe 500, 600 acres. Um, this year, we've made a, a concerted effort to burn more and, and got a little over 3,000 acres completed. Um, the second part of your question, um, how far down the list do we think we can get? Um, we turned in the first seven well, number four through 11, um, after the Linville Gorge areas to um, start NEPA work on um, last quarter. So, you know, we feel like with seven-year interval, return interval, we can get through those units and, and we still have some other shelf stock we can get into. Um, you know, we feel like we can get pretty deep into the first 20 units, I imagine. It really depends on the strategy used in applying fire because, um, some of our partners, uh, and I tend to agree that um, we'd like to burn a little more frequently on the restoration cycle, so we might want to burn two or three times in the first decade if we haven't ever burned in some of these units and get them towards a, a desired condition, and then we can back off to that once a decade or once every seven years um, sort of interval. Um, and that's where the 18,000 acres comes from. This is, you know, if we were to get the resources that uh, the grandfather district wants to burn, we think we can burn 6,500 acres or 7,000 acres a year. And that's, uh, so in the long run, we could get up towards uh, 60,000 acres we were managing with fire on the grandfather district on, on, with that sort of, uh, you know, with, with that, that sort of uh, scale of burning. Well, I guess I have I have one little follow up question if there if I if I may um, how is there a cutoff point on that list like the one I think down at the bottom of the list that has got like scored like seven or so is that an area that you would not want to burn is that because it's such a low score is, is there is there I guess my question is is there a tipping point on that list where you say oh okay. This just isn't a, this is a place where we probably shouldn't be burning. Well, Catherine, this is Josh, and I'm not with the Forest Service, but I can't really um, answer that for the Forest Service. But my own perspective on it is there's probably a reason for fire management in every single one of those units. 
Um, but because there's limited resources, I can't really see the grandfather district applying limited resources to a unit that scores really low right now. Is that, do you okay. know that, Greg? Well, I mean, there may be some sort of other mitigating factor. There may be a, you know, a subdivision, a high priority subdivision or something that would need protecting. Um, you know, we just have to look at it a case by case basis. Um, that really has never come up um, as far as a tipping point, you know, that we will not burn below a certain line. Um, you know, just with taking other factors into account. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, this is Terry. Can you hear me? We can. Um, just a question. Did you did you consider um, where we was protected um, by your burning as a potential scoring or weighting factor? WUI was considered, and uh, we're actually worked a little bit today in, in our logistical and our social impacts side. So really in this ecological side, um, we originally had WUI in there, but we, we thought it would fit better in, uh, in our, actually it, where it turned out today was in the social impacts. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the uh, the ecological model is just one third of the total model. Um, we broke out some other issues um, to be logistical issues or social impact issues that would just have to be addressed. You know, weren't exactly um, ecological, uh, couldn't be modeled ecologically, and so that's where Wooey Wooey dropped out. Go ahead, Beth. Here in your conclusion, um, you say other land managers may want to emphasize other values. I know you had some of those other agencies at the table, um, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. I know they've got lands right there. Since you guys are partners in the Fire Learning Network and um, try to work together, did, did they think that they could just expand this model onto the, the land surrounding the Grandfather Ranger District and use that? or has there been discussion that they would tweak it in a completely different way to use it on, on their lands? Uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission actually has started using a similar process on the South Mountains game land, which is um, a mountainous area in the Piedmont just south of the Grandfather Ranger District. And th they are using a very, very similar process, but because their burn units are smaller, they're doing uh, things to scale uh, how acreage impacts the score so that it's not so quite as acreage driven in that uh, landscape. Um, and I think that the results of, of their uh, first uh, ecological prioritization model for the South Mountains will be unveiled at next week's Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network. So I, I don't know anything about the results of how that worked out, but it seemed like uh, in talking with uh, Ryan Jacobs with the Resources Commission, it was, uh, it was looking pretty good with their initial efforts. Uh, it, I guess uh, when David Ray is here with us in the background, and he, he uh, noted that um, other districts on Nantahala Pisgah National Forest have decided to go through this same process um, and use this, essentially the same ecological model that we've developed for the grandfather district. And also, um, we are we've been tasked with leading the way in developing the um, social and um, logistical uh, models as well. Uh, for each burn unit to, to score how easy it would be to burn in them from a uh, logistical and then a social perspective, and what sort of human concerns or human benefits would be from uh, burning in, in those proposed burn units. Hey, Josh. Yeah. Uh, this is Sam Lindblom up on the Central App, <clears throat> excuse me, Central Apps at the Lynn. We've also, just to throw it out there, since we've got the same product from Steve Simone, we're in early discussions about doing this on the on the uh, GW National Forest and the Allegheny Highlands FLN site too. So really appreciate you breaking ground for us. It's good good to hear that, Sam. Um, and I think it's a, this sort of idea is something that a number of people um, have have had independently. And um, we had a, a group that we were able to, to finish up before some other folks. So uh, I'm, I'm interested to see how that effort works out. and. Glad that you all were able to get Steve to do the ecological zone modeling up there, too. Hey, Josh and Greg, this is Beth again. Somebody is here in the office with me. He was wondering how, how long it took you to get to this point. 
How many hours? How many days of getting together? Three meetings, four hours. Yeah, but we had about three meetings, working about four hours um, together as a group. And then we'd have some small homework assignments. Um, Gary Kaufman and Josh did a lot of the digitizing. Probably took the, the lion's share of the work there. Uh, as far as the mapping exercise with the quad maps and the magic markers and the district folks, you know, we probably got that done in four or five hours. Um, again, you know, we started getting bogged down real early, like, well, we can't burn here, we shouldn't burn there, we don't want to burn here, and, and we really had to back up just a little bit and, uh, and just draw burn units, and, and then we'll, we'll identify other challenges down the road. So, you know, really not a really whole lot of time. But I think having the scheduled the scheduled times where all the partners are together at the table definitely we get a lot more bang for our buck all sitting down together and um, we seem to have a finished uh, a product at the end of every one of those meetings. So. Yeah, it's it's like you guys said it, it's not um, not a, a function that you're the only ones out there thinking about it. It's, you're the only ones that made it happen. <laughs> Hi, this is Wendy. I have a quick question. Um, so you you guys obviously did this um, collaboratively. There were a number of of partners, organizations at the table. Um, for for other groups that are interested in applying the model, how how mature does that collaboration need to be? Would you think to to be able to to do what you guys did in an efficient manner? I don't know if there's one right answer to that question. Um, I think that. Uh, in some ways, a large group make, makes the process more unwieldy, but in other ways, it um, it, it lends to a better pro product that's better thought out, uh, and that more people have ownership with. And I guess that's what what we're all going for. Uh, but for instance, um, on Cherokee National Forest, we're trying to make a first run at this um, starting tomorrow, um, and uh, and it's just going to be a very small core group of people. They're, they're, there's not as many people um, within the fire learning network from uh, Northeast Tennessee, um, and so we're just going with what we have. And I'll just tell on us again because that's kind of what seems like what I do. But um, you know, we really focused on the external partners. With me being with the Forest Service, we had a lot of externals at the table. But our internal communication probably could have been better. So be sure, you know, if folks want to try this, um, talk to the folks down the hall too, not just people in other agencies. Great. And, and what would you say is, is the sort of the optimal number of criteria to put into your equation? How many did what did you guys have? Like six or so? I don't. This is Josh. I don't think there is an optimal number. We chose the, um, the the criteria that we chose were the ones we thought were the most important and the ones that we had information on. So some of the um, criteria that we excluded, we just didn't have data for. Like for instance, uh, we didn't feel like we had accurate information on the time of the last burn in each unit. We had no idea how long it had been since a lot of those units had burned. Um, and so we didn't want to make any assumptions about that. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have more information, I would say, and it's not too unwieldy, I would say use it. Um, and on the other hand, I think it's, it's important to, to go with what you have and keep it simple enough that um, it's easy to modify if you're going to try to do this on your own without a dedicated team of, of uh, mathematicians and ecologists and GIS whizzes to make a more uh, sophisticated model. I think Thanks. for the original idea um, for the model from um, Eglin Air Force Base and then it was linked to, uh, was brought to Camp Lejeune in the coastal area of North Carolina and they played with it and I think they started like with 11 criteria, they tweaked it down to 7. And I think this process here, you also started with about a dozen criteria in the beginning, and you've sort of whittled it down to seven. So it just seems to be some sort of, you know, magic number, you know, ten to seven. Probably if you have a lot fewer, it, it may not work so well. But it seems to be sort of a general idea. But you all have taken a very different, you've totally revamped the the Eglin and the Camp Lejeune model are a lot more similar to each other, and you all have totally retooled this. And I think it makes a lot more sense for your landscape. So it's really worthwhile rethinking your landscape first and not just, you know, try to borrow what other people have done first.
Yeah, this is Josh. I'll add to that. Uh, Liz asked me in an email how our process was different than the Camp Lejeune model, and I didn't know at the time how it was, but I went back and looked at the Camp Lejeune model. And um, th I think they had more more resources as far as um, expertise in GIS and mathematics when they were making their model. And they had information we didn't have. They did have that information of when was the last time each of their units had burned, mm -hmm. probably because of all the munitions and things that go on on the uh, Air Force Base and Army bases. Um, so they had that piece of information. And then their weighting and scaling was a lot more sophisticated than ours. So that w when we weighted and scaled our acreage figures, uh, we were pretty simplistic about it. There, it looked like their model was a lot more sophisticated. And I, I don't think within our um, working group we had as much mathematical expertise. So we just went with what we had, it, you know, worked with, just fooled around with it till it seemed to make sense. How does it feel like from the fire manager perspective to have this model now? What is different for you? Uh, I, I personally feel like I don't have to defend burning in the mountains. I think it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, we can just put that argument uh, to bed and, and move ahead with work. So that's what that's what it's really done for me on the district. And you feel like because you've kept the model fairly simple that you can communicate mm -hmm. this fairly well? Yeah, we've probably presented this thing five or six times now at all different levels. The, the forest leadership team, we've presented to the district FMOs. Um, we've presented it quite a bit, quite a bit of times, and um, have had good feedback at all, at all areas. You know, for us, you know, when we're starting to build a program, we're a little behind the times in building a program. Um, it kind of gave us a starting point, and uh, you know, starting us off in the right direction. It focused us, I guess I could say. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it enhanced? communication within your group? I sort of recall you know, at the first meeting there were, you know, t the timber shop was here, wildlife shop was here, and it seemed like it was a really good open collaboration. Right, yeah, we have had, we've, traditionally we've had pretty decent collaboration, um, again, really good with the partners, and then not so much, you know, I don't believe timber actually got to the table the first time around, so wildlife was represented, rec was represented, um, and so I'm not sure where we dropped the ball on that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an opportunity for folks to improve on or get all those different uh, disciplines involved. Are there any more questions, comments to go around? Okay. Thanks so much for doing this presentation, and um, it has been recorded. So I'll send the link out um, in today's networker. Thanks again, uh, Greg and Josh and Margaret and Beth. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. That was excellent. So long.